we'll kind of get started here at today's topics there. Common feral bee locations, the tools, preparation, do's and don'ts, removal types, four stabs gone, open air, cut out, trap out, a little bit as a, what to do as a profession and how to get into the business. Uh, kind of emphasize a little bit on transporting bees and heavy emphasis on keeping bees alive once you do it because uh, it's my honest opinion that you shouldn't remove bees unless you can keep them alive. There's not much sense in uh, moving them from a structure if you can't make them survive when you do so. Okay. So uh, let me kind of start off by uh, asking you, how many of y'all have removed bees before? So almost everybody in the class. Okay, good. How many of y'all have had bees survive once you removed them? Once. <laughs> once. And how many of y'all have lost colonies once you removed them? Almost everybody. Okay. So it's you know that there's a a lot of tips and tricks we'll talk to, about today later on about how to get them to survive and I'm. Going to try to get Justin to speak a little bit. Uh, so, some of the locations that we find bees, sorry about the mic thing there, is uh, well, we have an owl house over here on the left. How many, any of y'all done an owl house yeah. removal, bird house removal? Those are some of the simplest ones, I guess. Uh, sometimes not. Had a dairy uh, barn removal. Dairy barn, yeah. Uh, so, and then kind of in the center there, that's a, what I call a fillet tree, where we open the tree up and, and actually remove the bees and that's in the case where the tree's coming down. Um, I can't really see the picture on the right a there. Meter yeah. Inside the eaves of homes. Yeah. Um, old tires and junk that are hanging around properties. <laughs> oh that's yeah that's that's probably the um, if I remember right there was a tire on the ground there yeah. 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 So that may have been where I cracked some ribs, yeah. folks. So we'll talk a little bit about safety too. So uh, then uh, tree bees and, and uh, soffits. Soffits are probably one of the most common removals out there. Uh, other structures, um, you know, it's just, it, bees will live pretty much anywhere. Gas tanks, you know, septic tanks, uh, butane tanks, just about any kind of tanks. So. Uh, trees, houses, um, I'm sure if you've been around the beekeeping world a little bit you, you kind of realize that. So we'll uh, talk about some of the tools that we need uh, for removals. Uh, a hive tool is handy and I'm actually going to step away a second here and show y'all my favorite hive tool and give Man Lake a cheap plug. But this thing is big, bad. You can use it as a pry bar, hive tool. It's good and sharp, scrapes comb real well. And um, it also, a lot of times, I can take that hive tool on a soffit, bring it up, and actually cut that comb out from above in the soffit instead of using a knife. It's just a really handy tool to have. I, I really recommend it. It doesn't work very good when you're working your hives in the field but it works really well when you're doing removals. So, and, uh, and then as long as we're on tools here, smokers, uh, I typically carry three. Uh, I just got two today. Basically, I got a little cork in a box to keep my smoker in. Um, I, I find a lot of times I, I break the uh, bellows on them and they wear out. So I've started using this as a uh, a flashing uh, roll stuff. It's rubber tape basically with an aluminum coating on there. And just stick it on the bottom and helps make them last. I probably go through about five smokers a year. Uh, these things burn almost constantly every day. And these are, this one is probably about three weeks old. Uh, that one's brand new. And, and I don't have one that's older than about three months. So that's, that's how fast I go through them. Uh, what do we got next on our list there? We got box. So uh, basically, I like my box and um, just anything works. You know, uh, uh, the ammo boxes, uh, uh, metal bucket, just whatever you got to carry your tools in. Um, you need a, a bee box to put the bees in. So the, the vac box I design and use is is actually has a screen top and hopefully there's no bees in here. But you can put frames in 
and put the top over and then the vacuum just sets on top so when you're removing you can just frame your bees up right there suck the bees in there on your leftover bees and you're good to go just close the disc on it and haul them off Typically, we don't like to keep more than a couple frames of brood uh, out of a removal unless it's just good, dry, and clean. And it's proportional to the amount of bees you have. It's kind of like if you have a nuke and you've got five frames of bees, you want that thing boiling over almost. So you really want enough bees to cover that brood entirely and then some. Uh, when I'm vacuuming, uh, basically I usually, sometimes I'll run a medium in the middle of the box, but I usually only run about four in the box. And that leaves that center section open and gives them room to climb. So every once in a while, if, if, if things are going for a pretty good while, I'll shut the vacuum off, pull that lid up, give them time to disperse a little bit more, and then turn the vacuum back on because they will clump up in the middle there. Uh, when they're coming in. The vacuum is probably, I want to say it's almost my least used tool out there. I really don't like to vacuum bees unless I have to. This vacuum has a really good success rate on keeping the bees alive. It's, um, it's more about transporting them after you get them in there as far as keeping them alive and keeping them cool. Uh, I think we have some uh, queen clips. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all use the the uh, plastic queen clips. I, I really don't have a lot of problems with these. The main problem I have with them is that spring will get weak. If you'll just pull that spring off to the side a little bit, bend it over, and then pop it back in there, then it's got a good grip again. I use these because, you know, I, I, I probably go through a couple hundred a year on the queen clips so when I catch a queen and I'm dropping the bees off somewhere I'll either leave this in the box or when we dump the bees out I'll set it in front of the entrance because her pheromones will be on that clip and they tend to gather to that clip so that helps get the other bees in there so uh, a lot of times I'll carry a queen cage with me and I'll go ahead and cage that queen up and throw her in there um, it just depends if uh, if it's a really good bee I like and I want a marker or something, I'll go ahead and mark her. And I'll set it in the truck, when is up, AC going, pull the queen out, mark her, put her in the cage, set the cage in there. And when I, a lot of times what I like to do on the cage is, is just taking rubber bander up in there like that to get the bees in there. So, um, what do we got to unlearn? Tools, uh, ladders. Saws, um, basically I carry a jigsaw, I carry a, a chainsaw, I carry a skill saw, I carry two sawzalls, a battery operated and an electric sawzall. Uh, you just, just never know what you need there. And drills the same way, I carry uh, a battery drill, a battery impact, an electric drill, and uh, I think another spare battery drill. Uh, then. Uh, the uh, file size rubber bands, I really believe in these, the 117 B's. And the 117 is the length, the B is the thickness of the rubber band. So when you're framing up a, a, some brood, what I like to do is go ahead and place my rubber bands on the frames and get everything ready before I start. So I'll set up four to five, depending on the hive size. Sometimes I'll do a thermal if it looks real big. I'll set up more frames, but I always like to have 20 frames on the truck uh, just to make the day. So I'll set it up like that, and then I'll run one like this. And I'll run one like this. So when I cut my comb out, I'll lay it on a board or wherever I got to lay it on. So I'll cut that comb, keeping the orientation. I always try to trim that honey off the top and then just lay the comb in here so it makes kind of like a blanket to, to hold it up in so you're not having to try to hold that comb while you're doing it. And then I'll take and, and loosen this up and hold a rubber band like that. I'll take this one across, put it over here, and take this one across. Oops, 
and shoot the guy over there. So, <laughs> and then, so if you've got smaller comb, go ahead and run you some horizontal bands across and just support it all in there. The bees will chew this out and drag it out after they've welded all the comb together. And it's, it's always nice to see those bees draw, dragging the rubber bands out. You know, they're doing their job. Uh, don't worry about putting too many rubber bands. Um, and then a lot of times, once that brood's hatched or, and, or they've pulled queen cells, if you didn't happen to get the queen and, and you're done with that comb, just pull it out and, and you're wanting them to draw a good, nice comb anyway. Uh, if they happen to make good, nice comb on that, leave it. But be prepared to just trash that comb and reuse your frame for the next removal. What's uh, the rubber band? It's a 117B, and I don't know. Uh, it's basically a pile. If you Google pile, yeah. it's a rubber band that usually... Yeah, and they're not... They're, I think it's on uh, about 10, 11 bucks a box for a one pound box. If you go to the office supplies, they'll have a like a 50 pack or something for 10 bucks. Uh, so I really recommend if you're going to do a lot of removals, uh, buy them online. How do you analyze the comb to decide what comb to cut and keep and what comb to just leave? Well, basically you want brood comb. So you want open brood, cap brood. Uh, you don't want a lot of nectar in there at all and you don't want a lot of pollen in there. You, you basically, you want to rob them of all their food source, uh, which sounds cruel, but the reason you want to do that is because in Texas, uh, our number one predator that I'm concerned about is small hive beetles. Small hive beetles are attracted to the protein, and when you, when you have a box of bees, say it's a nuke-sized box in a nuke, and they've grown up in there, they know how to heat, cool, defend it. They've got their little small high beetle jails that they chase the beetles into. Well, as soon as you start doing a removal, you're, you've confused that hive, you've upset them, they're worried about all kinds of stuff. Those small high beetles will get in there in just a matter of minutes and lay eggs. So even though you've got, it, and I try to do most of my removals with bees on the comb still and actually work it, cut them off with the bees on the brood, lay them down gently, rubber band it up with bees on the brood. But you're still going to get those small hive beetles if they're in the hive, get in there and lay eggs. So a lot of the times, and, and I don't know the percentage rate, Justin may know better on, on percentage rate of uh, how many hives get wiped out with those small hive beetles in the first two days. Um, but I, I would guess it'd be more than 50%. Uh, so you really need to watch for the small high beetles and be prepared to c pull that comb completely. I don't feed my bees sugar water, I feed honey just because I have a uh, endless supply mostly of cut out honey. Uh, I, I open feed in my pasture, I've got about 60 acres and kind of feed out in the middle of that. Um, Justin feeds sugar water on his and has great success with it, but you want to limit their feed, not overfeed, and let them draw out fresh comb, and then it, that allows them to establish their home, uh, learn how to heat and cool, learn how to defend their area that they're in before those resources are in there that they can't defend. So that gives you a break and a protection against that small hive beetle. So it's, it's real important to, to kind of judge what comb you're putting in there and just pick brood. You don't need but a couple of frames of brood or just a little bit of brood for the smell to hold the bees in. So we're on a uh, repellents. So I like to, whenever I'm doing a removal, I, I carry a little spray bottle or a little spray bottle like this and I put Fisher's Bee Quick, Honey Bee Gone. There's a lot of different products out there. Um, I don't like using that Bee Gone, the one that smells so bad. I don't recommend it. Uh, so. Just uh, what, whatever you got. So I take and spray a perimeter around my removal work. I don't want bees to go. So, and then once I pop a soffit down, I'll look for those crevices where the bees may go and I'll put a perimeter in there to keep them contained. And uh, so the, the bee quick and, and the um, honeybee gone, all that comes in really handy. Um, I also like to keep uh, tea tree oil for doing smoke outs and lemongrass oil for attracting bees. 
Uh, depending on what type of removal I'm doing, uh, I use a lot of those too. Well, not so much the lemongrass. A bottle of lemongrass oil will last you a year. You know, usually you don't want to overdo it on that. And then uh, the uh, the B vacuum, we kind of went over that a little bit. The uh, infrared camera, if you're doing a lot of removals, a couple of hundred bucks will buy you a FLIR and they're well worth it. Uh, especially if you're doing removals on someone's home structure, you know, that you don't want to tear up. You want to make sure where the bees are. I think somebody had a term, uh, was it battleship, battleship <laughs> bee removal? Yeah. Uh, you don't want to be doing that. And then uh, the latest thing I've started using in, in, on the forced abscon is I've got this little battery operated blower. So when I'm doing a forced abscon, I can actually, I drill a three quarter inch hole in the tree and I can stick this blower in there and I can hold my smoker over here and suck the smoke in and blow it in the tree. Or I can put a little bee quick in there and blow the bee quick in there. One advantage to this is, I don't know how many of y'all have seen that forced abscon video that Stan did, and it really looks like I'm pumping a lot of smoke, a lot of smoke into that tree, but you, you got to realize that the draft that's going on there, the, the way the wind was blowing into that hole and I'm pumping in the bottom, that smoke was pretty much staying below the brood nest and just, just congesting down there from the draft coming in. This little tool here will fix that. <laughs> so it'll, it'll allow you to blow that smoke up into a tree or a structure and, and get it moving and get the bees moving. It also allows you, if you're smoking in a tree, because a lot of times when you're doing a tree, you'll have all kinds of voids and entrances and blowing that smoke out through there will force it up and you can find those escapes where the bees are gonna go. Uh, this is a D-Walt. Rigid makes one that's real similar. I think it's actually got the same caps. It may, I think it has one more screw hole or something, but they look real similar. And surprisingly enough, this 120 volt battery usually lasts during a whole uh, four stabs gone. That's so it's... Nice on the Home Depot. It's 99 bucks. Yeah, 99 bucks at Home Depot. The, the uh, drills, you get two batteries and a charger, where if you buy them separate, it's like 280 or something. So you get the drill and the blower? And two batteries. And two batteries. <laughs> oh, buy this by itself, 99 bucks. You get the drill for 99 with two batteries. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and I run the Dewalt tools. I, I, I don't think that Rigid's any better over Dewalt or any of those. Uh, but I do know that the portable Dewalt vacuum, the little cleanup vac I use sometimes, seems to work better than the Rigid ones. So, but. Back up just a minute. The tea tree oil, how you use it? Okay, so on a on a forced abscon or or on any removal, if you want a repellent, the tea tree oil is one of the best repellents out there. You can take tea tree oil and mix it with water or alcohol, or you mix it with the imitation almond extract, and just shake it up in a squirt bottle like this, and take you a bottle of tea tree oil about like this, and and uh, mix it all together, and it makes it a repellent. So. But I found that the tea tree oil is probably the best for removing bees from a tree. So what you want to do is you want to start smoking the bees in the tree first and get them out before you really apply the tea tree oil. The tea tree oil is going to drive everything out of the tree. It's going to drive ants, roaches, lizards, whatever's living in that tree is going to come out when you apply the tea tree oil. So what, do you, what ratio do you mix that? The tea Oil is coming directly into the smoker yeah. as the very last step of a forest abscond. And there's a video, he just doesn't know yeah. it yet. So, so <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so we pretty much covered, and, and also I have a camera with a little scope on it. And, and you know, basically I carry a, a, a tool kit like a construction worker would. I mean, basically I've got hammers, nails, screws. Every, you know, I carry an air compressor, a nail gun, a staple gun, uh, six different ladders, you know, the, the whole nine yards. So. Basically part of being prepared. Are you, cool. uh, the infrared gun, are you saying that you look for the bees using for hot, use it for hot spots? Well, I, the I don't use an infrared gun. I use an infrared camera. I'm sorry, the heat gun. Uh, it's an infrared camera, and it actually attaches to my iPhone, 
and um, I didn't bring it in, but I've got it out in the truck. So it'll take a thermal image of a, a wall or a brick wall, and, and the, the bees tend to keep about a 95 degree brood area. So when you're looking at that, the differential in temperature of the, the bees and the wall, you can actually spot those in there with that camera. As long as it's not in the middle of the day. Yeah, well, it, as long as there's a temperature differential. And it has to do with reflectivity of the material you're on and settings that you use. But once you get good with using it, then you can 90% of the time find that beehive with the camera. And that saves you from tearing someone's house up. So, Are, are they any good for looking into a tree? They sometimes are if you catch it early enough or enough temp temperature differential and you don't have a lot of uh, background light and depends on how thick the bark is because you get a lot of uh, variation but I have found them in trees with it. Just a note, maxtool.com has that blower for $79 free shipping and you get a free $89. <laughs> there you go, we need to post their name up there. 79 bucks, that's a deal folks. We're going to have a link at the end that will show it. So they're uh, really excellent videos. And, and uh, so, uh, okay, so have a backup plan. Yeah, we kind of skipped through that. But, you know, when, when you start a removal, be prepared. Get all your stuff out that you think you're going to need. You know, your boxes, your vac, whatever you think you're going to need. But then also don't leave yourself with just that amount of equipment you know if if it's a you got a tall ladder and, and you may have to run get a lift be prepared to go get that lift or you know just make sure you got more than one plan when you approach it because that's one thing I never do is start a removal and leave uh, I've run into Africanized hives the longest removal I've probably done was I started about nine o'clock in the morning finished at 2 30 in the morning and had a, a three hour drive each way to do it. And that was an Africanized hive. Um, it was 12 foot long and about five foot tall on one end and just a half a gable end on a church. It was, the hive was that deep. Uh, I found a queen at 8.45 at night. Uh, a long day, but you, you don't want to get out there and open up a hive and leave the general public exposed to one. If you need to, call help, you know. Well, what I do on those is, is I may split it, but uh, I think it's key to put a queen excluder top and bottom, lock your drones in and requeen it. And, and I'm not talking about a hot hive. Uh, you know, I, I run into hot hives all the time. People have aggravated them. They, their food source is low, something like that. You know, you're, you're taking a lot of stings. I'm talking about when I run into an Africanized hive, I work in blue jeans and a, and a uh, jacket. When I run into the Africanized hives, my blue jeans will turn brown, my jacket will turn brown, and I can't see out my veil. And basically, you know, I don't have them tested at that point. I just know that they're probably <laughs> Africanized. And, and uh, so, and, you know, I do around 300 removals a year. And I don't think I've ever done more than four Africanized hives in a year, and it's usually two to three. So, you know, the, the, the numbers are just not here. Now, maybe in your area they may be a little more prominent. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, it's, I, there's a lot of fear mongering going on about Africanized bees. They're, they're just not as prevalent, prevalent as prevalent. people think, prevalent as people think. So, thank you, Ashley. So, uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, so, be patient when you're doing these removals. Uh, that's one of the key things I try to teach people when they're working around me or watching me is is the time that it takes you know a lot all day to do a bee removal it may not take you an hour or may take you 12 hours but a lot all day what I like to do say in a soffit removal is I'll get everything set up have my smoker going everything and and uh, then I'll take the trim down gently as I can moving slowly slowly smoking the bees and try not to disturb those bees, and then I'll actually pop the soffit board down. At that point, they're usually gonna get a little upset. 
Well, then it's time to go take about a 15 minute break. <laughs> so what happens during that 15 minutes is the, the bees communicate by pheromones. Uh, the alarm pheromone versus the queen pheromone. The queen pheromone has a, a really long chain and is long lasting. The alarm pheromone is a short chain and it's shorter lasting. So in that 15 minutes, basically that alarm pheromone's gone. The bees have clustered back on their brood. They're gonna try to protect the brood and keep it warm. Not so much defensively protect it, but just keeping it warm. They're, they're keeping those small high beetles off. They're, they're trying to maintain some type of sanity going back on. So when you come back, move slow and gentle, and most of the time those bees will be really cooperative about you just going in there and cutting the comb out with bees on it and framing it up as long as you move slow and cautious and, and just be careful about it. Um, that's why I really recommend a lot of breaks, uh, especially on the forced abscon. Smoke them, let them, let them uh, get used to the idea that they're packing up, give them time to pack up, eat stores, and, and give them time to get ready instead of rushing them, and, and there'll be a lot nicer bees when you get them out. And they'll have a better chance of survival. And they'll have a, a lot better chance of survival if, if you're easier on them. Uh, keep your smoker lit. You know, it's, if, if you can't keep your smoker lit, um, maybe you ought to really think doing removals. <laughs> it's basically, that's one of the basic things you need to learn about beekeeping is always have that smoker ready. Whether you're using it or not, you need it ready. Because uh, when, when those alarm pheromones start, if you get one attacking you, you want to, you know, deal with it right away. You don't want a whole bunch more bees coming. So uh, spending time on the setup, you know, do all your preparation and everything you can think of. Get it ready and on site and laid out and, and think about where your ladders are going to go and your escape route if you have to get out and, and that type of thing. So... Uh, now, uh, you want to keep your comb in the same orientation when you cut it out. So you, when you're cutting this out, be mindful. A lot of times I'll set comb in a box or a bucket if I'm working up on a ladder before I come down and frame it. So I'll actually take the comb out and cut it. When I do, I flip that comb upside down when I set it in there so that the honey or nectar that's in there is draining out away from the brood. Then when I go to frame it, I'll pull it out, cut that off, and lay it in there. You want to be real careful not to get a lot of honey on your brood when you're doing a removal. Um, and keep that orientation, flip it back when you go back into the frames. Don't, uh, you know, don't, don't take on a removal if you have any doubts that you can do it. You know, it's, that's one key thing is, is attitude. You know, be, be positive that you're going to be able to do this before you, before you start. Uh, make sure you have the tools and the skills and a backup plan. You know, what do you, what do you do if it doesn't work? If something does go wrong, don't be afraid to call for help. Exactly, you know. Um, I, I get a lot of beekeepers call me just for questions when they're doing a removal about how to do it. Um, and I have know beekeepers that have called 911 and told them to come kill the bees. They were too much to handle. And, you know, if you're in a life and death situation, uh, you know, bees' lives matter, but, you know, human lives probably matter a little more, uh, or most humans, anyway. Uh, so, uh, you yeah, yeah, so, and you don't ever want to rush the bees, you know, keep the bees calm. You know, it's just like working your hives, doing inspections. You know, if you're out there doing an inspection and your hive comes out and they're, they're pissy and, and after you, close that hive up, go to the other end of the yard and do one, or come back later and, and do it. Let them calm down. Because they're not gonna get less aggressive while you're messing with them. So the slower you move, the more patient you are, the, the better for the bees and the better for you. Uh, clean up after yourself, you know, don't, don't be unprofessional. You know, that's like any trade, you know, don't leave a bunch of trash in the yard and, and that type of stuff. Uh, don't frame up too much brood. It's you know, if the bees, if you don't have enough bees to defend that brood, trash it, you know, melt it down, feed it to the chickens, something, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't try to save every ounce of brood if there's not enough bees to protect it, so. Yeah, okay. perimeter around your working area, like a physical perimeter, telling people like little strings if, that they back? I have in a couple occasions, like when I'm working, close to a school or something like that and uh, I'll kind of 
I've got some cones and tape I'll carry. Most of the time I don't. Most of the time I'm not disturbing the bees a whole lot at all. Um, it's just, I, I do let the neighbors know and uh, the surrounding people. If, you know, if I'm close to a congested area, I'll probably put some kind of barricade out. And I do have signs on my truck, reflective signs that say caution, you know, live bees. And, and I recommend those. Uh, get you a reflective sign. I can hook you up with somebody that makes them. Uh, just because of the fact that it's already gotten me out of a couple of tickets. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, <laughs> they tend not to pull you over, do they? Yeah. And did we, bring a, did we bring a buzz bar up? Or did I not bring one? You got a video? Okay. Let's, let's play the video. So here's, here's a new thing. This is from the Buzz Fest. I'd, I wish I'd, uh, all of you had made it, but... Yeah. Uh, so this is this is a rescue bar I designed and made, and and we're framing up uh, bees from a a flower pot removal we did live out here at the Buzzfest, and uh, so Justin's setting that comb in there, and then basically it's just kind of like a a rake, and then the the side goes on and compresses back in there, and then you hang the top bar in, and you're done. Are those natural gloves you're wearing? Yes. Natural? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Harbor Freight? Nine mil? Yeah. Nine mil's Harbor yeah. Freight? Yeah. And, you know, it's, I, if I wear gloves like that, it's not so much to protect from stings. It's just to keep the honey and stuff off your hands. Justin works bees all the time barehanded. He'll wear gloves. And, and he carries a, a little pocket veil, just a mosquito net, when, most of the time when he's working bees. So... And, uh, so here's some of the four stab scones was done. This one had Russian bees in it. That's actually I think a 128 millimeter Russian field artillery gun. Uh, that what? I think it was 144. One, 144. Okay. So uh, we got the bees out of here. They were living in this channel in here. Did a four stab scone. This is one of our latest ones that was a. Uh, this one was actually funded by a, a bee rescue group that's funding me to do some removals for them. And then they're taking the bees to their apiary area and raising them to uh, make honey. Uh, this is typically a tree, four steps gone. A lot of times I'll set a bait box up, put a drop of lemongrass oil on there, a couple of frames. When I'm doing that four steps gone and I'm forcing them out of a hole, set something above there, even if it's just a, a simple you can use foundation, you can use a frame. If you take a frame with a piece of rubber band on there, you can usually hang it over a twig or something up above their entrance, put a drop or two of lemongrass oil on there and give those bees a place to migrate. If they're on a frame on the foundation and those bees are covering it, it you'd be surprised at how much easier it is to see and catch a queen on foundation versus thick oak bark. It's, it makes a big difference. So. Uh, and they don't always go there, but usually you can chase them there and you can lay a, say the hole was here, you could lay a perimeter of, of bee gone or, or bee quick around here and here, and the bees are going to tend to move up, so you're blocking them from there and, and kind of forcing them to go that direction anyway. So, uh, yeah. So we, we actually did this removal. Uh, I did this wearing safety glasses, barehanded, um, caught the queen, and moved all the bees out without vacuuming on this job. So uh, open air hive removals are some of my favorites. Uh, there's a really good uh, Vimeo video of this one that Stan did, and he's flying a drone behind me. and. Oh, she's got a little clip. Go ahead, go ahead.
this how I've got frames sitting here with rubber bands on it, a box sitting over here to put them in as I'm going, buckets for my tools and my smoker and to put the scrap comb in. So, you know, I, I basically got everything laid out around there that I need within arm's reach. Um, and cutting this comb out basically with bees on it and uh, then framing it up right there on location. So the, the least amount of time that you've got comb without bees on it, the better off you are. Um, how much time we got, Ash? At seven minutes. Seven minutes, do we wanna? I know, okay. I'm uh, talked a lot about a lot of this. Yeah. So this is, this is actually a tree that I did an abs or a removal out of, and that's a limb that broke off. So that was a, a pretty good sized limb. It crushed a storeroom and a fence and something else on the neighbor's property or two neighbor's property. Uh, this one out here was actually an interesting one. Uh, this was probably the most expensive removal I ever did. Um, and I'm real good about quoting a price. Uh, people tend to like an upfront quote. I quoted this removal at $300. Uh, I wound up getting paid two thousand dollars to remove that hive there. They, uh, it's interesting because the lady actually had these were coming in a dormer window upstairs, going in between a hallway staircase. In that hallway staircase, there was a mural of bees going up, and she didn't want me to cut into that wall to remove the bees. So we went in through the bathtub, which I'm kind of glad we did because this entire wall from floor to ceiling was bees and the bathtub underneath was completely coated with bees all the way around it. So we wound up taking the wall out there and then going in the attic from the little crawl hole entrance and taking a four by eight sheet of plywood off back there and the beehive basically covered the entire bathtub. Uh, trap outs, um, I don't do them very often, but I do do them. This little setup here is a um, toilet flange, I think you call them and then just a piece of eighth inch hardware cloth built into a cone. The toilet flange has these little twists that you can drill a couple of holes and, and kind of mount it anywhere you want and mount that over there. I think I've got a little rubber tape or something back behind there to fill some voids. Um, um, Brillo pads or um, oh, can't, the scrubber pads. Steel, uh, steel wool, there we go. It works good for stuffing those boards when you're working too. And then I've got a little bait box. I just mounted a couple of uh, um, brackets there and put a board to set my hive box on there. How long and does those, that usually take? The four staff's gone. It could take a month or so. You know, it's, it's in this case, uh, that wall was probably 20 something feet. Right inside on the opening inside, there was an opening into the building. They were getting into classrooms. This was at a college. So I sealed the inside up before I did the four steps gone. And this was a solid concrete wall. Uh, they didn't want to tear the wall out. So we went ahead and did a four steps gone on this one. Uh, bee removal as a career. You know, I never thought I'd been doing bee removals as, for a living. Uh, I'd done several removals before I actually got into it professionally. Uh, the first removal I ever remember doing was for my mom. She had a, a tree that fell over and had bees in it and she wanted to save those bees so I went and did it for her. Um, the uh, important things about it is go ahead and register with the uh, Texas, do what? Oh yeah, we, you can check downstairs, there's a booth where you can register. But go ahead and, and register with the inspection service. It's five or 10 bucks, you register your apiary, it makes it all legal. It's not a, um, basically it's, it's not a license, it's just a registration. So um, that gets you on their list of bee removers. So when people are calling in about, you know, who can remove bees in their area, it's free advertisement or low cost advertisement. And just, I recommend it. The folks at the Bee Lab are, are really good or the Apiary Inspection Service. Um, 
you want to make sure if you're working around houses, I mean, if you're doing removals in a barbecue pit or, you know, a water meter box, you may not want to worry about insurance. But if you're going to work on somebody's house or business, uh, make sure you get insurance. Uh, I don't know if there's an insurance guy here today. I think I have one of their pamphlets in my truck. I didn't bring it up. So if anybody's interested in a contact to get insurance, I do have some information on that. Um, it's not that expensive and well worth it. Um, let's see what else we what got. Does the insurance cover? It, cover it, it hurt? Or? No, it, it, it covers uh, liability as far as you do damage to somebody's house. You cut into an electric wire or a plumbing pipe, something like that. Did you have a question? So, the service that you provide um, is you perform the cutout, remove the bees but to do the reconstruction is someone else's job. Well, it, it, and that depends. I do do reconstruction sometimes. Uh, only if I can feel safe that, that the area can be sealed off and, and completely done. I never like to seal one back up if I can't uh, scrape everything, be, be sure that the comb's gone, spray it with some paint, and seal it so bees can't enter back in. A lot of times, if a beehive's been there for a year or two uh, or more, you want to go ahead and just leave that open and have somebody come back and do the repairs after the neighborhood bees have done come cleaned everything up. So Otherwise, the time, they'll just get bees back. Most of the time, you can be expected. I'm going to pay you to come remove the bees, and I'm going to have to get the construction work done by somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and I'll do that, just not this time of year. You know, so in the busiest time of year, you know, and, right. and I always let the customer know up front that I can do it. And if I feel like it is, I'll, I'll just go ahead and include it. And that's usually like on a soffit that's wood that you can pop back up. If it's hardy, forget it. You know, it just ain't going to happen. Uh, so uh, let's talk about transporting bees. Um, you know, I have this screen cover on my vax, and I also build a screen cover that sits over the box. It has a little riser with a vent hole across it. I didn't bring one. So that allows me to carry the bees and get airflow going across there. Uh, we'll take sometimes to squirt them down with some water to cool them off. Uh, in the extreme heat of the summer, I've taken and set bags of ice over a solid cover over them to, to let it uh, cool the bees down. Uh, just think about cooling it. Uh, Jennifer Scott down there in Alvin, she uh, sometimes carries an air conditioner with her to air condition the bees on a removal. And so uh, keeping them cool is, is, is important. And keeping them dry and warm in the winter time if you're doing a removal in the winter. And yes, I, I, I do removals in January, December. Um, I actually did one in December that I found three queens in and 20 queen cells and a 10% drone population in Austin last year. So that's, they're out there. So we got uh, any questions real quick because we're probably out of time. Yeah, so if there's a little bit of comb that hadn't, you are, you are a nail or something around there, I'll, if you can see where the comb's been, I'll take a plastic coat paint, I think that's what it's called, plastic coat or kilts or um, in, any type of enamel type of paint to cover that up and seal that smell in. Uh, that'll keep the bees from coming back better. And then if you can, uh, stuff that void with some insulation or something. You don't want to do it on a vented soffit where there's airflow. But usually if you're just blocking a two-foot section where the bees were, then you're doing all right. And then you want to seal up. When you're sealing that uh, area, if there's any gaps, what I use is aluminum screen wire. I buy a three-foot roll, three-foot wide by seven-foot or eight-foot. I'll cut that up and stuff it into those voids before caulking lays over. Because if you caulk an area where a beehive has been, the bees will chew through it to get in and get the resources that's there. So, uh, a couple of links here. You can look me up on Company B at Facebook.com, Company B's Texas, of Texas. Yeah. And oh, uh, if you've got swarms and stuff or beehives that you know of that you can't get to there's a page i created that's called bee swarm removers of texas you can go post on that if you join as a member 
Uh, one of the big things about it is if it's a swarm, go get it right then. Tell somebody you're getting it, but don't wait the next day, don't wait an hour. Whoever can get to it first, go get it because I don't like to see bees move into structures that just creates more work for me. Uh, and I have plenty. Uh, prime bees, uh, a lot of good information on Ashley and Justin's site. And Honkin' Goose Media, some of the best bee entertainment in the world, right back here with Stan. Uh, I really recommend going to his site. He's got some great stuff on there. So uh, thank you all for coming today. And if you've got any questions and want to catch me, uh, my next class will be swarm removal over there after lunch. Uh, but I'll probably be hanging around the bee weaver booth downstairs um, throughout the day. So just look me up down there and feel free to ask anything you want. And just let the rest of the bees move in on their own. Um, so what's the purpose of this? Just the purpose of this screen, once you get them in there, the bees are in there. So you lock them in, you can transport in this. I have about 30 something of these boxes. So I can do a removal, go set this box directly in my yard with a lid on it. And then I don't have to mess with it till I get time to go back and mess with it. Or I can drop this box off to somebody like Justin and Ashley and then they can work on it later on. Is this just a, a normal box then, right? No, this, this box has an extra two inch lip on it that allows you to put frames in here. Now, the 